And so finally, with six seasons, The Crown comes to an end. This is a big deal for Netflix. This was one of their crown jewels, and certainly, I think, their most adult show. This was like, well, HBO has a, a, a lot of different types of shows as well, but this was like their HBO like prestige drama. And they don't, they're not going to have it anymore. But what a run! What a run! I watched it all the way through, and I wonder how many of you stuck with it. It's been a little bit tough over the past couple of seasons as it got to current the current royal family, and we're going to discuss that uh, a little bit in this review. So Netflix gave me episodes six through nine of season six, part two, very far in advance. Like as soon as part one dropped, I had part two, and it was a del- I'm, I. I did enjoy this season, but they held off with the series finale, episode 10, until the very last minute. And when I got it, it was over an hour, an hour and 12 minutes. And I was like, ooh, it's like a little bit like a movie. I'm so excited. And I I thought they might have held it back because it had like a surprise or two in it. And it does. So uh, Crown fans should look forward to that. But also, I think the most surprising thing about episode 10, the very last episode of The Crown ever, was how devastating it was. It was just so shockingly sad. Uh, Really sad, I don't wanna give any spoilers away, but it was super sad. Prepare yourself. And for a series that has been extremely pro-monarchy over the years, at the very last minute, it seemed to do a 180, almost as if to say that the British monarchy had at this point served its purpose. Or, to be a little bit more blunt, It's been managed so poorly, which can no longer be hidden due to modern technology and a more aggressive, less revered, revering media, right? Uh, That there's no one suitable to take over. But doesn't every generation feel that way? That would be my argument. I'd be like, "Mm, I think everybody feels that nobody, nobody good is next. And then it works out. Uh, That seems, but that seems, so that seems to be the crown, this show's argument. But as they make it, Uh, as well as, by the way, I thought this was interesting, questioning if a queen or king really has to die before the next generation could take over. And I gotta tell you, on that point, I'm not sure what the answer is. I could see that, I could see the point that they were making, but I think they actually argued both sides. And I think they argued both sides quite well. Uh, But I do feel that overall, this show, to the very end, in my opinion, presents an argument very much in favor of the monarchy. So this is fascinating. Everybody's got an opinion on the British monarchy, and I'm very curious to hear yours down below, particularly if you've been watching this show. But watching all six seasons of The Crown, as an American, mind you, I've come to see that the British monarchy is vital to the identity and preserving the identity of the UK. Perhaps the British monarchy doesn't evolve as much as the British people do. I think they're getting there. I think that's partially what you're seeing. Uh, But I think they're very much there to preserve, uh, as I said again, the UK identity. And the British monarchy is a constant force that isn't swayed by needing to be popular, aka re-elected. And I think that's the whole point of them. So they can look at the big picture. So the system, as they call it, dedicates itself to looking out for the British people, the best interests of the UK like the regular meetings with the prime ministers. I think that's clearly been important. Uh, You know, uh, advocating for the perspective of uh, Britannia and the people. And then also, they have tremendous charitable endeavors, you know, when they're supposed to. And on that point, Prince Charles, now of course King Charles, he gets a shout out about his charitable endeavors. And I thought that was really meaningful and deserved because despite his, his numerous flaws, Nobody can argue that he hasn't been truly remarkable on the front of of doing best for England in that regard, charity. Uh, Plus, he's also worked very hard to protect the look of England by safeguarding its historical architecture, which is why London is a hodgepodge of old and new, which I think is great. Uh, Prince Charles, or now King Charles, just wants to keep the country from looking too modern. And while that might frustrate some people who live in England, just like it frustrates some people who live in Paris, it very much, and they do the same thing there, by the way, they're very, very strict on the architecture, particularly in the main part of Paris, the touristy part, to be honest. I think it is crucial to not only the identity of the country, but you know the fact that there, uh, Europe in particular is so reliant on tourism. So if it doesn't, if no longer looks like what people, like myself, like Americans, 
and uh, people all over the world want to see when they go there, well, then, you know, you're not going to get as many visitors potentially, and so much of the economy relies on tourism. So I think the British monarchy, by the way, also helps there uh, by giving uh, England that, that different identity. And, you know, because of the British royal family, I think that's one of the things that helps set it apart from the rest of the UK, besides setting themselves apart, thanks to Brexit. Oh, we're not going to go there. All right, so Prince Charles... His insistence of bringing down the expenses of the royal family, which he's now starting to do because he's finally king, I think that is an appropriate solution because it balances out the British royal family's vast personal wealth and rightfully takes the burden off the taxpayers. Because, you know, they can afford to pay for stuff themselves largely. I'm curious, having watched The Crown, what are your thoughts on the future of the British monarchy? Does the UK need them? Uh, it's definitely a complex question. And while I just told you my thoughts on that, to be honest with you, I'm not sure how I would answer that if I lived in the UK. I don't think, I think having a royal family over you is certainly a very different situation than seeing one across the pond and saying, what a, what a cool country, it's, it's so charming. Uh, you know, some of you might be like, we don't want to be charming. Well, I, I, but I just, but think about that. You know, how do you think it would affect your economy and your standing in the world if you didn't have the British royal family? What would you, I guess you could turn Buckingham Palace into, would they get to keep, would the family get to keep all those things? It's interesting. All right, so anyway, with part one of this final season focused squarely on Diana, which was fascinating and appropriate considering her impact on the royal family, the UK, and the world at large, Part two focuses on the royal family finding itself after her tragic death, certainly a seismic event for them. And not just refocusing, but I think evolving, particularly for them. I mean, it might seem like a glacial pace to us, but for the royal family, these are big steps uh, and big questions that they're asking themselves. Some people have said that when the crown hit the Charles and Diana years, it became too personal for them, with the show not accurately representing what they themselves remembered as they personally witnessed those events unfold in popular culture. Now, I don't remember Diana's death at all, so I was fine with all that stuff. But I gotta tell you, I see where you're coming from, because I am familiar with the William, Harry, and Kate stuff. So I was like, wait a minute, I think there's a lot of stuff missing here, and it began to annoy me. So now I know how some of you felt watching the Charles and Diana episodes. Uh, I felt a lot was left out. For instance, William and Kate's romance is depicted as quite romantic, when in reality, her pursuit of him was much more aggressive, and I'd say far from romantic. Um, and then also, he was not very interested in Kate and dated many, many other women before deciding to marry her. The crown doesn't get to their wedding, uh, nor the rumored affair that William had years later with a close family friend, which to me is mind-boggling considering that he, what his parents went through that he would do that. And I think that's also very interesting, um, you know, about history repeating itself and the son and the father. But the point is, if this show was a little more honest about the start of William and Kate's relationship, things that happened later on in it would make more sense. I mean, you would never guess those things happen later on based on how they start out here. And you might say, well, maybe that's just, maybe things just went south. But I, we happen to know that this is not the way, this is, this is a romanticized version of their early days of their relationship. Uh, you do see William and Harry growing apart, which is not only very sad, but you see how much Harry is like his mother, which I think we've all come to see at this point. Also, speaking of scandal, there's no discussion about the rampant rumors of Harry's parentage. Even, and that's all I'll say about that, but even though the issue has never really been resolved and could be very easily resolved with a paternity test. But I think that really does, you know, why bring it up? Well, I think it, you know, probably contributes to how Harry feels about the family and those elements and how maybe the family feels about him. Uh, I just think that, you know, not to, just to pretend that never, I mean, you don't have to focus on it necessarily, but not even a line. And then, so as I said, lots and lots of things left out, perhaps to cut the current generation or the upcoming generation a bit of a break, perhaps because they're so new, it's harder to get the historical perspective on them. And then also, maybe it's all these things, maybe after Diana, the royal family has closed ranks to such a degree that the writers of the crown couldn't get as much information to really dig into. Another issue with these final episodes, which kind of works in tandem with them leaving a lot of stuff out, is that even as they are, they feel very rushed. Uh, you know, even if I didn't know that there was a lot being left out, I still feel they crammed too much 
into the remaining six episodes, especially with an entire episode dedicated to Princess Margaret's declining health and eventual death. Like when the episode started, I was like, oh, come on, we're right, right in the middle of the William, Harry and Kate stuff. We can't take this kind of detour, but I'm so glad we did. Ah, oh, cause this episode with Princess Margaret was incredible. It was also devastatingly sad. It did a real number on me. I was crying all over, crying all over my living room. Uh, but it's also exceptionally powerful. Not only that it gave me the feels, but I think it's a warning sign to anyone who isn't taking the best care of themselves, putting it off, right? I mean, it's so relatable. It was really amazing. I feel this episode should be shown in doctor's offices and everyone should see it. Uh, the season six part two episode about Princess Margaret is what the crown has done so well for all these years. This is their sweet spot. And I think that the inability to do a similar deep dive like this into the newer members of the royal family, William, Harry, and Kate, is part of what makes the final episodes of uh, the season of the show seem so rushed. You're like, oh, that was amazing. Are we going to do one for William, Harry, and Kate? And they're like, no, we're not. And they're like, don't it. And I I suppose that's a very good sign that one of my biggest complaints about the final episodes of The Crown is that I want more. Uh, As for the cast, after taking a backseat to the Charles and Diana drama of season five and even part one of season six, finally with these last episodes, Imelda Staunton gets the chance to really dig into Queen Elizabeth like Claire Foy and Olivia Colman did before her. Uh, I think that I think that thanks to these episodes, the older Queen Elizabeth became more of a person to me. I saw her as more of a real person rather than a distant figurehead. Because it was weird after spending so much time with her when Foy and Colin played her to step back like we did in seasons five and the beginning of part six was jarring. You know, and uh, Queen Elizabeth became in some ways comically villain, uh, uh, a a comic, uh, a villain. And, And I think that that, you know, she made bad choices for sure, but I'm glad that she was humanized here in the end. Society so often dismisses senior citizens, depicting them as not totally there. And I think that even in real life, Queen Elizabeth was often depicted and treated like that. So it's really great to see the crown show her as a dynamic, complex individual, made even more so by experience. It might've also made her a little quieter, more self-reflective, but it's there, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's similar to when I watched uh, Meryl Streep and the Iron Lady, and there was just so much going on beneath the surface. It was really fascinating. Uh, so I think, you know, it, it does speak to age and the evolution of a person, uh, but it doesn't mean that that, does, that doesn't mean they're not, uh, not still in there. So that was great. Jonathan Price captures some of the rascal quality of Matt Smith's Prince Philip that was missing, in my opinion, from Tobias Menzies' version. I like Tobias Menzies quite a bit, but this seemed like the adult version of what Matt Smith played. And I think season six shows that uh, Prince Philip and Prince Charles, while Queen Elizabeth was the front front person that, that everybody saw, Philip and Charles are very much responsible for keeping the royal family going. Uh, they, they did just as much in their way. And yes, the crown continues to be extremely pro-Charles, which I know has confounded and even infuriated many of you. Uh, And as I've said, Dominic West isn't even really playing Prince Charles because he's infinitely more heartfelt and charismatic than the real Charles. Just by casting West, this show became very, very pro-Charles. I mean, I think they were very accurate and and I think particularly with Part one of season six, I think they were very positive with Diana and really did a wonderful job depicting her. Uh, But I wish they were as realistic with Charles. I think it would have made a lot of their relationship make a little bit more sense. Uh, So yes, I mean, uh, West continues to be a joy to watch on this show. He's phenomenal, but this is not what Charles was actually like. If Charles was like this, I think he he would have been and today be more popular than he actually is. Uh, Now, obviously, the crucial castings are Ed McVeigh as Prince William, Luther Ford as Prince Henry, and Meg Bellamy as Kate Middleton. Uh, They're all very good actors, very charismatic, but I think of all three, Ford is the one who most accurately portrays his real-life counterpart, especially knowing what we know now about Harry. This performance really makes sense. Uh, McVeigh and Bellamy are more portraying, as I said, a fairy tale version of William and Kate, and they definitely deliver that. It's so interesting, speak, you know, speaking of the cast, that this show portrays Diana and Harry very accurately and unflinchingly, which I think is more to their credit and more to, as, as a service to them to show what they really were, but yet it romanticizes Charles and Camilla and William and Kate. Uh, I wonder why they decided to make, I think 
I mean, Dominic West is so good. Uh, but I think those relationships would have been a little bit more interesting if they'd had the depth and, again, as I said, the unflinching look that Diana and Harry's portrayals do. And really, though, bravo to Leslie Manville as Princess Margaret in her standalone episode. I'm genuinely surprised she isn't getting more attention on the award circuit for what she does here. Although, unfortunately, Elizabeth Debicki is also competing in Best Supporting. And, I don't, you know, it's such a competitive year, as it is always now with television. Uh, I think there just isn't enough space for both of them. And I think of the two, you got to go with Debicki because of who she was playing and how she pulled it off so spectacularly. Uh, Leslie Manville's is a more quiet um, performance, but that makes it all the more devastating. I hope at some point Leslie Manville is uh, recognized for her work here. It's just absolutely incredible. So yes, while season six, uh, part two, was my least favorite run of The Crown, they were all still top-notch episodes, and I'm glad that I watched them, and I would encourage you to as well, because even when they made me sad or frustrated, they also made me think about what I was looking at how it related to the real world, real life counterparts in the UK and, and you know the global stage, and even also myself. And I think that's why The Crown is such a special show, that it makes you kind of do a deep dive into what's around you and yourself. And I think that's incredible. Uh, I think that's one of the reasons some people like history. I, and also, I'm a history fan. Um, and I like, I like history and soap operas, and that's pretty much what The Crown is. Uh, the final episodes are out right now with, as I said, so a little bit of surprises in episode 10. So I hope nobody ruins those for you. Uh, if, particularly if you're a big fan of the show. You'll, you'll, I mean, I think you can kind of guess what it is, but it's nice. It's nicely done. I'd love to hear your thoughts on The Crown, which ran for six seasons and covered almost 60 years, just like they promised, 10 years a season of the British monarchy. Great stuff. I loved it. Uh, so share your thoughts. To, I think they could have had one more season on William and Kate, but it's fine. Whatever. It was great. All right. Share your thoughts down below. Subscribe today. And of course, as always, you can check out some more videos right now.